Okay, let's get into the Word of God this morning. Really, I really encourage this morning by the themes that we've already heard. We've talked about the armour of God. Yeah, that's really important for what we're going to be looking at today as we start this new year, as we prepare our hearts for what God has in store for us in this exciting new adventure that we go on. Um, and also, we've been hearing about singing a joyful song to the Lord. I'll sing for joy at the work of your hands. I'm not an amazing singer, but God likes my voice because he made it. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about joy. I want to talk to you about joy and about how we can have joy as followers of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I think there is a more fitting subject or topic to look at at the start of a new year as having joy. You see, having a genuine and authentic joy that doesn't depend on circumstances or earthly affairs is really important for the follower and believer in Jesus Christ. It's a result of a healthy spiritual life as a follower of Christ. If you are healthy in your faith, if you're in the place where you're meant to be with God, you should have joy, the Bible tells us. Amen? It's a sign that you're in the right place. It's also a gift from God. It's not something that we conjure up ourselves or it's not some emotion that we stir up, but it's something that God pours out in our hearts as he gives himself to us by his spirit. Who wants to be blessed this year? Amen. Can I see any hands? Who wants to know they're in the right place this year? Who wants to have the joy of the Lord this year? Do you know what? It's the joy of the Lord that sets us free. It's the joy of the Lord that is an expression of that armor of God that John has just talked about. You see, the joy of the Lord is something that protects us when we're going through things in life. It strengthens our hearts. It keeps us in the faith. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10. Joy strengthens our hearts. It keeps us in the battle, doesn't it, John? It guards our heart from bitterness, from envy, and from a whole host of heart sins. You know what? You know when you're guarded and protected by the joy of the Lord, by the joy that comes from Jesus Christ himself? Do you know, that will protect you from taking on bitterness, taking on envy, taking on jealousy, taking on depression, taking on these negative things that, that come into our hearts, these seeds that the devil sows to try and take us away from the will of God. We need the joy of the Lord. It's the very thing that sustains us. It brings relief to us when we need it the most. You know, the psalmist says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I want to tell you today that you might not have experienced the joy of the Lord for a while, but it's coming. Amen. Weeping may, may last for a moment. It may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. God has got great joys and great blessings to pour out from us, but we need to do our bit if we're going to receive it. You know, a spirit-birthed Christian joy should be and it needs to be the prevailing characteristic of the life of every Christian, of every follower of Jesus. The joy of the Lord should be the pursuit of every follower of Jesus. And I'm going to demonstrate why this morning. If you want to turn with me to John 15, we're going to read verses 1 to 11. That's John 15, verses 1 to to 11. Father, we want to give you praise for a new year that you brought us this far and that you will surely lead us home, Lord. You will lead us to the promised land. We thank you, Father, you've not left us orphans, but you've given us freely of your spirit and that you promise us joy and peace and contentment in this life and abundantly in the next. Lord, would you move me out of the way this morning and would you reign the glory of Christ down in our hearts. Lord, we pray, give us eyes to see what's written in your word. Let it not just be head knowledge or intellectual exercise, 
but let it be a spiritual encounter, we pray. Let us meet the living God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name, by your spirit and for your glory. Amen and amen. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Someone needs to hear that this morning. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, even so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The Lord bless his reading to us today. Amen. So it's really remarkable, isn't it, that we have the words of God himself written in scripture for us. This is not a second-hand piece of uh, message from God. It's not that God's inspired a biblical author to write a message from God, but it's actually that Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, the God-man, fully God and fully man, who came 2,022 years ago, and that's what Christmas that we've just celebrated represents the advent, the coming of our Lord. That God himself in Jesus Christ said these words and that they've been recorded for our understanding. And what he has given us here, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, he's given us a blueprint laid out before us on how to have perfect joy. Not just a sort of alright joy, but a perfect joy. We're not, and one thing that I really need to just uh, clarify here before we go any further. We're not talking about happiness here. Yeah? I did a bit of research on the internet yesterday. And there's a lot of uh, Christian teachers or theologians kind of equating joy with happiness. Um, I don't think joy is happiness. I think happiness is here one minute, it's gone the next. You know, if um, you know, your mother's just died... You know, you don't feel happy. Do you know what I mean? But the joy that comes from Jesus Christ is supernatural. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on worldly affairs. If you're going through something difficult, like your mother dying, or say you're really going through a trial, you can still have joy. Hallelujah. I've experienced it. I've been through pain and misery in my life as a follower in Jesus. And I've been on my knees weeping and crying. And God has given me supernatural joy by the Spirit of God. That is not happiness. That is something much deeper. It's called joy. And it comes from God. And Jesus here promises in this text that we will have joy if we abide in him. Now, the word abide is central to this text. It's mentioned 10 times in this passage that we've just read. There's 10 references to abide. There's three references to bearing fruit. And there is one reference to joy. And then there's a final reference to a fullness of joy. That's the climax of today's passage. I want to say to you today that your joy is determined by how much you are abiding in Jesus Christ. It's determined by your relationship with God. Are you abiding in the vine? 
Because Jesus Christ is the vine and we're the branches. That's what the text says. And if we're abiding in him, then we will bear fruit. And one manifestation of that fruit is that we will have joy, unspeakable joy, unquenchable joy, joy that doesn't depend on natural or earthly circumstances. Now, there's many manifestations to the type of fruit that God bears in our life when we abide in him. He gives us the desires of our heart. He gives us not only joy, but peace that surpasses understanding. He blesses us. He prospers us. He gives us children. He, he, you know, he opens doors in life for careers and vocation and his purpose. He blesses us financially. He provides us. You know, there's, there's, there's loads of manifestations of bearing fruit. But I want to talk to you today about joy. Because I think as we go into a new year, joy is really important. We want to be in the joy of the Lord. We want to have a joy that is a complete joy. Because that was Jesus Christ's will for his people. And that's summed up in these final words. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be full. That's the will of God for your life, that your joy would be full. Do you know what? I love it when it says that my joy would be in you. That means that, that, means that if we have his joy, we have him. Yeah? We possess Jesus in our hearts. He's living and dwelling in us if his joy is in us. I want you to think about that the next time that you experience the joy of the Lord. Think, wow, I'm experiencing Christ right now. He's living in my heart. That's amazing. And do you know what? His will is that you would abide and live in that joy continually. So Jesus says these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I mean, if Jesus promises, promising us here that abiding in him will bear fruit leading to fullness of joy, then the question we need to be asking is how do we abide in Jesus? That's an important question for this new year. How do I abide in Jesus? I mean, if we want everything that God has for us this year, we're going to have to abide. It's not going to come by how much we know in a head knowledge way. It's not going to happen by how much we can do in our own strength. But it's, it's, we're only going to receive what God has for us if we are in him, if we are abiding in him. We don't want to waste another year, do we? I don't know about you. I don't want to waste a second in this life. It's short. When I get to heaven, I want Jesus to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. You didn't waste. You didn't squander what I gave you. Yeah? I don't want to waste a second. And so therefore, I want to pursue Jesus. I want to abide in him more. And I want to walk and live in his life and in his joy. So let me begin by pointing you to that final phrase again. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This language is very characteristic of Christ's ministry, especially in John's gospel. You see, Jesus says something very similar in the next chapter when he's also talking to his disciples. He states this in John 16, 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Hallelujah. There's a reference to prayer. God gives us joy by answering our prayers. Hallelujah. And Jesus himself in praying to the Father in John 17, that amazing high priestly prayer where we learn so much about the Father's, son to, the Father's relationship to the Son. Jesus says this in John 17 verse 13. But now Father I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Hallelujah. That is the will of God for your life. Everything that Jesus said and did was for the glory of God and for the joy of his people because God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Well, our joy is complete, not in the world, not in worldly things, but in him and in him alone. And you know what? In doing this, Jesus also obtained joy himself. You see, in Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight of sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God. I bet you can tell that's one of my favorite verses. I absolutely love that, that passage. It's incredible. But this is it. There was joy set before Jesus if he did the will of God and endured the cross and went through that. He receives joy, eternal joy. You see, Jesus said in John's gospel, again in chapter 4, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You see, for Jesus Christ, accomplishing the will of God resulted in the joy of the Lord, in Jesus, the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joy was, Jesus was full of joy because he was completely submissive to the Father's will. And his joy was, a, was complete because he was in continual submission to the will of his Father in heaven. I want to tell you today that your joy, brother, is deeply intertwined with your obedience to the will of God. And when we accept sorrows as well as pleasures from God, when we do what John did, and we see this, you know, this difficult time, and we're willing to have our faith refined like fire, when we're willing to press into God in the difficulties and distress, as well as the pleasures and the blessings, well, we're going to be given joy. That's what the Bible promises. Our joy will be complete. Hallelujah. In order to walk in this joy, we need to seek, obtain, and do the will of Almighty God. Now, we looked on New Year's Eve at the will of God, didn't we? We looked and we discovered that there is two wills of God. There is a revealed will of God and there is a secret will of God. Question time now for those who were there. Uh, you know, if, if you weren't there, you can catch up on it on the YouTube channel. The, the video's up there. But, but can someone here give me an example of the revealed will of God? What is the revealed will of God? Check and see if you're listening now. His word. Yeah, that's right, brother. That's right. His word is his revealed will of God. So God makes no his secret, his personal will for our lives when we follow his revealed will in Scripture. The secret will of God is the providential will of God, the sovereign will of God. The will of God that's been done in John's life and in Joseph's life and in the Davidger's life through that circumstance that arose. He's working to a purpose. He's refining faith. He's doing something that we don't always see or understand in the moment. That's the secret will of God. But the revealed will of God is repent and believe the gospel. Do these commandments and live. Hallelujah. The revealed will of God is found in the text of scripture. And God makes known the secret will of God when we come to know the revealed will of God, when we read it, when we study it, when we live it and obey it. This is what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12 too, when he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And do you know Martin Luther on that? He said that the will of God becomes good, then it becomes acceptable, and then it becomes perfect as we are renewed in our thinking more and more the more we come to know scripture. That's the journey that we're on. If you're struggling to accept the will of God today, keep reading and meditating this. Keep obeying and seeking to live according to the revealed will of God and God will reveal to you the secret will. Is there people in here who want to know what their calling is? What am I called to, Lord? What do you have for me in the future? What's my purpose as a follower of Jesus? I know I'm here for a reason, but I don't know what my calling is yet. Well, get to know this. Live out this, and God will reveal the rest. Do you know what? I know loads of Christians who come to me and say, in Bible calls you, loads of them. They used to say to me, oh, I don't know God's will for my life, man. Can you pray for me? And usually I ask them, are you reading your Bible? And they'd often say no. And I'm like, well, I'm not praying for you then. Go and read your Bible. Get to know God in his word and the secret will, the call in your life will be made clear. Do you know what? I love the fact that Jesus himself says the same thing in our text today. He refers to his word once in John 15 
and keeping his commandments twice. So for Jesus, abiding in him is abiding in his word. And that means living out his commandments through the love of God poured out in our hearts. For Jesus, abiding in his word is synonymous with abiding in him. He's calling us to study the word, to meditate on the word, to rest in the word, to obey the word, and to surrender to the word of God, to surrender to the will of God. That's how we bear fruit, guys. That's how we have joy. That's how our joy is made complete. Man, I think I'm going to preach on joy for the next year because I'm loving it. Come on. Yes, God, we want more joy. In Psalm 119, verse 111, it's a uh, massive chapter that. He says this, the psalmist, Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. Hallelujah. Can you say that about God's word today? If you can't, then read it, read it, read it until you can say that. You know, Jesus is saying, abide in me. I'm the true vine. Abide in me. Abide in my word. But it's important to stress this. He's not referring to an intellectual exercise here. It's not about how much knowledge we can fit in our heads and acquire God gave us an intellect, yeah, and we need to engage with God intellectually if we're going to be holistic, we're made in his image. However, the call of Christ here is holistic. Jesus is calling us to abide in his word, live in his word, rest in his word, and dwell in his word if we're to rest, live, and dwell in him. Abiding in the word of God is going to require your whole heart, your whole heart soul and your whole mind it's going to require the holy spirit you see the holy spirit is also central to abiding in christ it's impossible to abide in christ without the holy spirit it's impossible to have a fruitful bible study if it's not done without the holy spirit we're not just like secular like university students here or something we're not just reading a book just to get a bit of knowledge We're reading a spiritual book here. This is supernatural. It's transformative. I mean, it's impossible to abide in the word of God, to abide in Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. Just as it is impossible to truly abide in Christ without abiding in his word. We need both. One doesn't work without the other. I think it was R.T. Kendall who said, if you read the word and and not be filled with the spirit, you... um, you, is it, oh, I can't remember, you fill up or something, no, no, but, and, and, oh, I can't remember, you dry up, that's it, if you read the word without the spirit, you dry up, but if you're all spirit and no word, you blow up, and that's true, we need to be balanced, we need word and spirit together, Jesus said that when we abide in him, we will bear fruit leading to fullness of joy, and the Holy Spirit is the one who produces that joy in our hearts. It was Nehemiah who coined the term, the joy of the Lord. But it was the Apostle Paul who brought that greater New Testament clarity when he recoined the phrase, the joy of the Holy Spirit. And that's found in 1 Thessalonians 1.6. Luke 10.21 tells us that Jesus... Christ himself rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Wow. There's a deep connection between the Holy Spirit and the joy that we experience. I want to tell you there's a deep connection between your emotional well-being, between your mental health and your experience of the Holy Spirit, your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You see, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Paul includes joy in his list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And in today's text, Jesus is essentially saying, if you abide in me by the Spirit of God, you will bear much fruit leading to fullness of joy. We need to follow Paul's teaching, guys, this year. We need to be a people who are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And you know what? In Ephesians 5.18, where that command is found, and it is a command, it's in the Bible. Yeah? 
It's not just be filled with the Holy Spirit if you want to. It's be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to, to live a Christian, godly life, pleasing to Christ, to live in the will of God. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day. I can't love my wife. I can't love my son. I can't love you guys. I can't love the world without the Holy Spirit dwelling in my heart, that amazing, incredible love of God. And you know what? When Paul says that, be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Greek word there is be continually filled. It's not a one-time event. It's a continual experience. Be filled, be filled, be filled, be filled. We need to be a people this year who are filled with the presence of Almighty God. We need to abide. We need to bear fruit, leading to joy by keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. If the worship team would like to come up. You know, what I'm saying this morning could be summed up in Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. That really is what we're talking about this morning. As we seek God in this new year, as we engage with prayer and fasting, not this week, but next week, we're going to be looking at prayer next week because that's another way that you can have fullness of joy when God answers prayer, when you seek God in prayer. But what we really want to be doing as we're praying and seeking God at the start of this new year is that the Lord will make known to us the paths of life. That he would make known to us his will. And he does that through his word and through prayer. But not just that. That as God does make known to us the path of life, that he would fill us with joy in his presence. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to open up the front now for prayer this morning. Because you know what? The Lord is the one who gives joy. The Lord is the one who provides joy. The, one, the Lord is the one who restores the joy of our salvation. Scripture has said. He's the one who wants to meet you where you're at right now. So why don't you come forward and come and receive some prayer this morning. We're going to lay hands. A lot of people don't want to lay hands at the minute because of the COVID stuff. I don't know about you, but I think a faithful church lays hands for impartation. And we're going to pray and believe this morning that God is going to impart something special in your life. He's going to impart joy that's not based on what you've been through for the last few years. It's not based on what's going off in your life right now but it's a joy that comes straight from heaven yeah Jesus said let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that will is that our joy would be complete and full not satisfied in what the world can offer but in what Christ and Christ alone bled and died and rose again to give us for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross and despised the shame and the promise of God over our lives is that our joy can be made complete too in him. so why don't we come forward why don't we receive prayer bring your need to Christ this morning we believe in God that he's going to fill people with the Holy Spirit this morning fresh power fresh grace from up on high fresh joy and fresh life in a new year you know we need to know the joy of the Lord it's how we know that we're in the will of God it's how we know that we're in the right place Father would you pour out your spirit upon us this morning